Hello and welcome to the theatre at Parliament House, Canberra. We meet here today where people have met for thousands of years and I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Nambu peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the eldest past and present of all Australia's Indigenous people. This is the fourth annual Harry Evans Lecture, which recognises the unsurpassable contribution of the Senate's longest serving clerk, the late Harry Evans. I extend a warm welcome to the Evans family who have joined us again for this occasion. May I also welcome former President of the Senate, the Honourable Margaret Reid, uh, several other senators and former senators who are here today, and uh, I've spied several former ushers of the Black Rod in the crowd. The lecture series was established by my predecessor as Clerk of the Senate, Dr Rosemary Lang, who is our presenter today. In establishing the series, Rosemary aimed to highlight Harry's reputation as a fierce defender of the Senate and to focus on matters he championed, the rights of individual senators, the value of parliamentary democracy and the importance of the Senate as an institution. Rosemary's focus on these matters and on the principles which underpin the Senate's powers and procedures were evident throughout her Senate career. Appointed as Director of Research in August 1990, Rosemary later inhabited each of the Senate Department's senior advisory roles. She was appointed as Deputy Clerk in 2005 upon the retirement of the late Anne Lynch, herself a trailblazer for women in the parliamentary service. As Deputy Clerk, Rosemary produced the Annotated Standing Orders of the Australian Senate, a magnificent, if somewhat niche, reference work directed at illuminating, <laughs> illuminating the standing orders through their history and rationale. Appointed as Clerk following Harry's retirement in 2009, Rosemary also edited the 13th and 14th editions of Odger's Australian Senate Practice, bringing her considerable scholarship to that task. On a personal note, can I just say there can be no greater gift for an incoming clerk than an up-to-date edition of Odgers. Rosemary retired last year, having served the Senate uh, with distinction for 26 years. Rosemary is now a member of the Advisory Council of the National Archives of Australia and post-Parliament continues to illuminate the Senate as an institution through her research on its first president, Sir Richard Chaffee Baker, and his stewardship of the Senate in its early years, the subject of today's talk. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosemary Lang. Well, thank you very much, Richard. And I echo the acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the land. I'd also like to begin by acknowledging what an honour it is to give this lecture in memory of a great Australian. To thank members of Harry's family for coming here and to acknowledge another great mentor to many of us here in the audience, in Anne Lynch, whose birthday it is today. Thank you. <laughs> it was Harry Evans who first introduced me to Sir Richard Chaffee Baker, or Dickie Baker, as he liked to call him, the first president of the Senate. Baker, though a native-born South Australian, had been educated at Eton, Cambridge and Lincoln's Inn and had gone on to be an influential delegate at the Constitutional Conventions at the 1890s, bucking the standard colonial obeisance to all things Westminster. Like Tasmanian Andrew Inglis Clark and a few others, Baker questioned the very rationale of the theory of responsible government while promoting something rather more Republican in character, though always under the British Crown. Now, when the Senate Department's major centenary of Federation project, the four volume biographical dictionary of the Australian Senate began to get off the ground in the 1990s under the indefatigable editorship of Anne Miller, four sample entries were prepared to illustrate how the project could be done. An entry on Baker, researched and written by Dr Margot Curley, was one of those four pilot entries. Now, perhaps it was a strategic choice given Harry Evans' great interest in the subject, but Harry needed little convincing that this was a worthwhile con contribution to the history of Federation. He remained the dictionary's strongest supporter, particularly at estimates, which are up next week, I hear. What a shame I'll miss them. Oh. 
Harry also read all entries, even after retiring, bringing to the task his unrivalled knowledge of Australian political history. Of course, he saved us from untold howlers, but more notably, he contributed magisterial introductions to the first three volumes, providing an historical overview of the periods covered by each one of them. As retirement grew closer, Harry would sometimes talk about pursuing a full-length biography of Baker as a retirement project. Sadly, it wasn't to be, but he had planted the seed of an idea. So today's lecture represents some first steps towards realising that objective on his behalf, and it provides an opportunity for me to express my gratitude to Harry Evans not only for everything he taught me, but also for contributing to keeping me out of trouble in my own retirement. I suspect our approaches would be really quite different, but one of the joys of working with Harry was his tolerance of different approaches. Journals of the Senate aside, he rarely insisted that something be done his way and only his way. Except, of course, when he did, but there you go. <laughs> In his introduction to the first volume of the dictionary, Harry singled out Baker for his dogged but unsuccessful attempts during the conventions to steer the constitution away from the cabinet system of government, whereby the executive power is exercised by ministers dependent on the support of the lower house of the parliament alone. Baker favoured the Swiss style of federal government with a separately constituted executive government no less accountable to one house than to the other. Although he lost the battle, he was determined that the Senate should strike out on its own to interpret its constitutional role free of unnecessary dependence on British models and traditions. And all this despite his quintessentially British education. Although he was deeply conservative, Baker was a nationalist who didn't regard what Harry Evans described as the Westminster cringe as an essential element of his conservatism. Above all, Baker was a federalist. His strong belief that federation was in the interests of all the colonies overcame his adherence to a particular model of federalism. He was sufficiently original and flexible in his thinking to a cleave to a new, particularly Australian model of governance in which a Senate, representing the people of the states, was a critical element. Before there was a nation, he had a deep sense of the national interest, largely founded on the economic benefits to the colonies of free trade between them and of a uniform tariff. And we must recall that Baker had a significant economic stake in the national interest. He had pastoral and mining interests across several states. He was a capitalist federalist. As a wealthy man and a South Australian to boot, he was fond of pointing out that he was the first native-born South Australian to achieve numerous offices. As president, Baker steered the Senate standing orders sufficiently away from the House of Commons bias of the Senate's first clerk, Edwin Gordon Blackmore, to equip this bold new institution to exercise unprecedented powers in the world of parliamentary government. He brought to the role a huge reputation as a highly effective and even-handed chairman from his background as a long-serving president of the South Australian Legislative Council, but more importantly, as the chairman of committees of the 1897-98 Constitutional Convention, which meant that he conducted the detailed stages of the debates, as opposed to the debates in plenary. In that role, he wrangled hundreds of amendments that had come out of the colonial parliament's earlier deliberations on the draft constitution bill. At the end of the final session of the convention in Melbourne, when the details of the bill had been exhaustively considered, convention leader and future prime minister, Edmund Barton, commended Baker's organisation of amendments in a very complex committee stage ensuring all received a fair hearing and a vote, and running the proceedings with tact, skill and judgment, in addition to his devotion to the cause of federation. 
Now, delegates might also have fallen off their chairs to hear convention president, Baker's deadly enemy, Charles Cameron Kingston, claim that it had been an undoubted pleasure to cooperate with Sir Richard Baker in the discharge of the business of this convention. And when I say deadly, barely six years earlier, Kingston had challenged Baker to a duel and supplied the pistols. <laughs> Was Kingston finally learning some diplomacy or did he actually mean it? Well, but it was one thing to be a talented chairman. Baker also contributed substance. Through his studies, readings and experience, he brought well-founded ideas about governance to each of his roles as a member of parliament, convention delegate and presiding officer. In particular, as Senate president, he fought to ensure that the Senate's significant financial powers remained as envisaged by the founders, or at least a significant proportion of them, specifically those representing the smaller states. He didn't always win. To Baker's mind, strong financial powers were the key to a Senate that was virtually co-equal in power to the House of Representatives, as befitted the body charged with representing the federal elements of the Constitution. In the short to medium term, one would have to conclude that he failed but the foundations he laid remained available for rediscovery when interest in the Senate and what it could do revived in the second half of the 20th century. For this reason alone, Sir Richard Baker is someone we should know a lot more about. While Dick Baker himself didn't leave a great deal in the way of personal papers, there's a wealth of source material about his life and times. Most of the big Federation names knew him very well. There are numerous portraits of Baker, but as Mark McKenna has noted, we lack much in the way of pen portraits. Alfred Deacon, who described many of his contemporaries in arresting physical detail, avoids describing Baker's appearance and focuses instead on his knowledge of all matters federal, knowledge which Deacon assessed as in advance of all his colleagues. We might wonder whether Deacon deliberately avoided mentioning one of Baker's most prominent features. His alarmingly excessive waxed mustachios. And he remained attached to this fashion for decades through his 30s, his 40s, his 50s, and his 60s. The last being a sketch by Charles Nuttall, who did the other big picture of the opening of Parliament in 1901. But we do get some glimpses. An earlier South Australian colleague, W.B. Rounceville, in 1915 recalled descriptions of the memory of the, uh, the members of the Colton Cabinet of 1884-85 as the Ministry of the Talents or the Ministry of the Giants. Apart from Chief Secretary Colton and Treasurer Rounceville, the Cabinet included Attorney General Charles Cameron Kingston, Jenkin Coles as Commissioner of Crown Lands and Immigration, Thomas Playford as Commissioner of Public Works, and Richard Chaffee Baker as Minister of Justice and Education. All were around six foot tall, except for Playford, who was six foot four, and Baker, who at about five nine was the smallest man of the lot, and a clever, smart, subtle fellow who never got on well with Kingston. George Pearce also gave us a character sketch. He was a Labor member of the First Senate, Minister for Defence during the First World War, and still the record holder for the longest serving senator. Having commended Baker's impartiality and fairness in the chair, he observed that Baker had a very peppery temper and didn't suffer bores gladly. He gives us an example of an obsequious senator who craved the president's indulgence to, um, to make a few observations on a matter, was told sharply by Baker um, not to apologise to the president for his presence. He wasn't responsible, it was the electors of his state. 
So in the chair, Baker mastered the acerbic put down pretty well. Dick Baker was born in June 1841. He was from a large family, the eldest son of 12 children born to John and Isabella Baker. His father, John Baker, was the son of an earlier Richard Chaffee Baker. Here's John. Born in Somerset, John migrated at 21 to northern Tasmania with a brother and a sister and worked as a shipping clerk before starting a shipping business. He married the daughter of a wealthy Scottish businessman, George Allen, in Launceston in 1838 and left for South Australia the same year, his wife and siblings following in 1839. Initially, John Baker was in the business of shipping sheep and horses from Tasmania to South Australia, but he soon became established in stock and land sales, with some whaling on the side, formed the Adelaide Auction Company, acquired numerous rural holdings and a substantial house in Broome Place on the north side of the Torrens River, building Morialta at Norton Summit near McGill in the Adelaide Hills, which was a substantial country home. McGill neighbours included Dr and Mrs Penfold in Grange Cottage. Yes, that Penfold's Grange. With substantial business and civic influence, John was known as the King of Morialta. He was a member, trustee or chairman of any institution in Adelaide that mattered, a benefactor of the Anglican Church. John Baker was also a politician appointed to the pre-self-government legislative council and elected thereafter. He was South Australia's second premier. And although he was in office for only 11 days, it was during that time that he negotiated what we now know as the Compact of 1857. This was the financial understanding between the House of Assembly and the legislative council that would later become the model for the Compromise of 1891 and therefore the key, in my view, to Australian Federation and the financial powers of the Senate relative to the House of Representatives. In short, John Baker was a pretty formidable man to have as a father, although he died at only 59. He was the model of the capitalist politician. Well, on Boxing Day 1855, aged 13, Young Dick Baker boarded the sailing ship Victoria on a voyage to England and school at Eton. His father had entrusted him to the care of Mrs John Morfitt. And there she is with John. They were later Sir John and Lady Morfitt and were founders of, of South Australia. She was travelling to England with her ten children, including her eldest son, John Cummins Morfitt. Now remember John because he'll reappear. We know some things about the voyage from Morfitt family records compiled by George Cummins Morfitt, son of the aforementioned John Cummins Morfitt. But a rather more charming version of the story was passed down by the Morfitt's third daughter, Ada. Here she is, a little later in life. She was 12 at the time of the voyage and she passed tales of, of what happened on to her granddaughter, Geraldine Peterson Cragg. She's the one with the curly hair on your left. Um, Geraldine wrote it up as a children's story, published in England in 1940 as All Aboard for England and in America in 1941 as The Melfords Go to Sea. Parading as thinly disguised members of the Morfitt family, the numerous Melfort children make preparations to sail to England in the yearly packet, the Regina. The real ship was the Victoria. Where it is expected that the boys might spend a few years at schools, although actually they don't. Reflecting contemporary rates of infant mortality, the two youngest children are known only as the old baby and the new baby. Jack Melford, aged 11, is delighted when his mother informs him that Dick Butler is going to travel with them to London. Indeed, 
Jack couldn't have been more delighted if he'd been told that Robinson Crusoe was to be his fellow traveller. Robinson Crusoe obviously was one of his favourite heroes, so the stage is set for a boy's own adventure story. Two years older than Jack, Dick had a lively reputation for fun and deeds of daring. Jack imagines swimming and climbing the rigging while with Dick, but things don't begin well. Despite their families knowing one another, the boys hadn't previously met. So Jack parts tearfully from his own father who exhorts him to be kind to Dick because he doesn't have any of his own family with him. Then he sees Dick leaning pensively over the stern, a slender figure in immaculate nankeens and a black straw hat. Jack makes a casually adult remark about the weather that he's heard his father make. But Dick utters a queer sound and waves him away furiously with his hat. When Dick fails to join the Melfords for nursery tea, Jack assesses him as too grand or something and resolves to hate him. But later on, seeing Dick's blotched face, the penny drops, and after some mandatory fisticuffs in their tiny four-berth cabin, the two boys become firm friends, as boys do in such tales. While the story's focus is largely on Jack and Ada Melfort and their adventures, Dick's distinguishing features are his wit and the map that his father has given him to mark the position of undiscovered islands and ships and other interesting things. Now, this recreation forms the end papers to the uh, American version of the tale. The map becomes an absorbing occupation as the boys decide what to include. At Dick's suggestion, they settle on a system of description with useful information for travellers. Given their rather limited horizons, useful information comprises what to wear to describe latitude and what to eat describing longitude. First of all, they pass through the calico latitudes, then the red flannel latitudes, the all on by night or quick bed latitudes, and finally the all on by day latitudes. As it becomes colder, whales and, and uh, icebergs appear, the captain surprises everyone by confirming that they are indeed sailing east rather than west and will round Cape Horn rather than the Cape of Good Hope. Of course, this turns out to be just as perilous as it sounds. Food and water supplies rapidly dwindle from the plentiful longitudes through the cold meat, the potted meat and the jam and tin fruit longitudes respectively. As the boys await imminent shipwreck rounding Cape Horn, they polish off the last of the um, plum cake and pudding from those longitudes before the ship breaks free of an iceberg and they turn north, enduring days of mariner's fare um, before entering the very little and almost nothing latitudes. Their first sight of land is Pernambuco on the tip of Brazil. But the yellow fever flag is up and they can't land, so they go a little further to uh, Alinda to reprovision. Now, Mama Melfort, her letters of credit for Western Australia and the Cape of Good Hope, now utterly useless, dons her finery and goes ashore to pawn her jewellery to buy food for the little ones. Because, of course, the captain has swindled them again, just as he had out of Adelaide, by buying a layer of good stuff to cover the top of the provision store and pretty ordinary stuff to go underneath. Adventures continue. The new baby is kidnapped by savages who board the ship before the clever Melfort children outwit them. Finally, they dock in London and Dick Butler is met by an uncle and aunt and carried away in a carriage after thanking the Melfords for their kindness. It's a charming folk tale, but there's no doubt some semblance of truth in the basic threads of the plot. 
Wealthier South Australian settlers in particular did decamp to the motherland for shorter or longer periods. Children were sent home for their education, particularly to Oxford and Cambridge, though less commonly to English schools. The voyage by sailing ship was long and perilous and um, the circle route around the Horn saw ships venturing far into Antarctic latitudes to catch the strong westerlies. There are stories of settlers' babies being kidnapped in South American ports en route to South Australia and subsequently rescued. My own feeling is that Dick's map and the types of information he populated it with are too good to be inventions. They strike an authentic note and reveal a character with a systematising mind and a facility for structure and organisation a mind that would later turn to constitutional and institutional design and operation, including, of course, the rationale of standing orders. Well, after four years at Eton, Dick went up to Trinity College, Cambridge in 1860 and was admitted to Lincoln's Inn in 1861, graduating and being admitted to the bar in 1864. He then came straight home and set up in legal practice. Little more than 12 months after his return to Australia, Dick married Catherine Edith Colley at St Peter's in Glenelg in a double wedding ceremony with Catherine's sister Isabella and, and grazier William Reed. Their first son, John Richard Baker, arrived in October 1866, about 10 months later. Their second son, Robert Colley Baker, arrived in May 1879, after an unexplained gap of nearly 13 years. And I don't have an explanation for that yet, and I doubt that there will be one. Two years later came a third son, George Chaffee Baker, who didn't survive, and then finally a daughter, Adelaide Edith Baker, in April 1884. Addie, according to Governor's wife Audrey Tennyson, was charming and amusing and much into fashion, as we can see here at the age of 20. So although John Richard married a rival, the younger children didn't marry and there were never any grandchildren. So unlike the Morfitts, the Baker line now has no family story keepers of direct descent. Well, by 1868, at the age of 26, Dick Baker was a member of the House of Assembly for the district of Barossa. Here he is, he's still got his student goatee and desperately in need of a good barber. He was appointed Attorney General in, the, in John Hart's third ministry, but he resigned to look after his father's affairs when he sickened in 1871 before he died the following year. Baker was then elected to the Legislative Council in 1877 and was from then on a Member of Parliament continuously till his retirement from the Senate at the end of his term in 1906. In the 1877 campaign material, Dick's native-born status was highlighted, along with his late father's reputation, his previous experience as an MP, and interestingly, in light of his later path, a perception of non-partisanship. A piece of doggerel published at election time referred to that clever young fellow Dick Baker, our long-headed, strong-headed Baker, a chip from the stock of a famous old block, our plain-dealing, right-feeling Baker, straightforward in action and free from all faction. Few members did better than Baker. And obviously he won. Notwithstanding his periods of ministerial service, Baker apparently preferred the freedom of being an individual member of the Legislative Council, a role possibly more compatible with his extensive business interests. From time to time, he wrote opinion pieces for the press, including on industrial relations, individual taxation, socialism, and of course, federation. Given his views and his advocacy for Federation from an early date, his choice as a delegate to the 1891 Constitutional Convention in Sydney was not surprising. And he took to the conference a comprehensive manual. 
It was for um, the delegates. It was about federal constitutions, and it had comparative material from the USA, Canada, Switzerland, and South Africa. The manual was on one of only four pieces specifically prepared for the convention. The others were the draft constitution written by Andrew Inglis Clark, the draft constitution written by Charles Cameron Kingston, and uh, a, a manual from a Tasmanian, uh, Thomas C. Just, under the title Leading Facts Connected with Federation, which was prepared primarily for the Tasmanian delegates. The manual was unique as a, as a constitutional text. Well, Baker's status changed at the end of 1893 when he succeeded Sir Henry Ayres, of Ayres Rock fame, as President of the Legislative Council. Among many other things, Sir Henry was the father-in-law of his childhood shipmate, Ada Morfitt, who a year younger than, than Dick. It's probably worth considering what led Baker to the chair in the first place. He had held ministerial office and seen the revolving door of colonial politics. His refusal of office on more than one occasion perhaps indicates that his interests lay elsewhere. His father had been Premier and there's no sign that Dick sought to emulate him. He was, however, surrounded by old family friends and uh, relations who had earned great respect as presiding officers over lengthy terms in office. These included Sir John Morfitt, Sir James Hurtle Fisher, who was South Australia's first commissioner and M Morfitt's father-in-law, and his own brother-in-law, Sir Robert Dalrymple Ross, who died in office as Speaker in December 1877. As President of the Council, he, Baker had a chance to secure his status and reputation as a leading man in South Australia, particularly after he won a long-running battle to secure an appropriate place for the presiding officers in the South Australian Order of Precedence. Undoubtedly, after a slightly rocky start, he developed a facility for chairing that allowed him to put partisan considerations aside and ensure fair play in proceedings. Now, Baker's reputation as an impartial and fair chair was brought to national attention at the 1897-98 convention, where Quick and Garron report that he took the chair in committee at the Adelaide session amidst cheers. Here they are. He resolved to seek the Senate presidency not long after. But the situation wasn't without some irony, given the shenanigans over where the first meeting of the convention would be held and who would chair it, all very well described by Alfred Deakin. Adelaide won the prize, Kingston won the presidency, but in the event, both Kingston and Baker were largely sidelined by their um, respective roles as president of the convention and chairman of committees, which limited their public participation. <coughs> Baker's scheme to keep Kingston off the drafting committee was probably as dastardly as his mustachios. Thus, ego, mutual hatred and bloody-mindedness denied the convention the unrestricted contribution of two of its most expert members and foremost proponents of federation. And here they all are. Um, Baker is in front row, second from your left. Um, the clerk of the convention, Blackmore, is back row, second from the left. Um, Kingston's in the wicker chair in the middle as president. Behind him, slightly to the right, are Deacon and Barton and uh, Sir John Downer's over in middle row, far right. So they our founding fathers. The majority didn't agree with Baker's views on responsible government and true to the prediction in his opening speech to the Adelaide session, responsible government and its conventions would come to exercise disproportionate influence in the careful federal balance. But for all this, Baker's enthusiasm for federation didn't wane, and despite health problems and associated, associated with the kidney disease that would finally kill him, Baker remained keen to become the Senate's first president. Baker's journey 
towards the Senate was echoed by that of another South Australian, Edwin Gordon Blackmore, who was appointed as the first clerk of the Senate. In a comprehensive account of the opening of the first parliament and the associated revelry, Audrey Tennyson captured the excitement of having so many South Australians in influential positions in the new parliament. Kingston in cabinet, Holder and Baker as presiding officers and Blackmore as clerk of the Senate. Now Blackmore was also of Somerset origin, like the Bakers, and had arrived in South Australia via New Zealand, where his medical father had taken the family to join a son who was secretary to Governor Gray. Blackmore saw combat in the Maori Wars in 1863-64, before leaving to join another brother in South Australia in parliamentary service. He was appointed parliamentary librarian in 1864, where he befriended the poet Adam Lindsay Gordon, an amateur jumps jo jockey and one-time member of the South Australian House of Assembly, who later sold him a jumps horse. In 1869, Blackmore became clerk assistant or second in charge in the House of Assembly and clerk in 1886. The following year, he was promoted to the more senior post of clerk of the Legislative Council and clerk of the parliaments. So it was in this post that he also clerked the 1897-98 Constitutional Convention. His papers from the convention are now in the wonderful National Archives of Australia, having been found in a bottom drawer of a South Australian parliamentary officer in the 1960s. They are meticulously well organised, demonstrating many good clerkly habits that are still discernible in Senate practices. You should check the indexing, there's much you recognise. Dick Baker and E.G. Blackmore both gave long service to the South Australian Parliament. But there was also another familiar face on council staff at this time. Blackmore's second in charge, Oh, there we go. Blackmore's second in charge from 1888 was John Cummins Morfitt, Dick's cabin mate from the voyage of the Victoria to Great Britain in 1856. When Blackmore was granted furlough by the Legislative Council in 1900 so that he could recover from the rigours of the convention and travel home to hobnob with all his House of Commons and academic connections, John Cummins Morfitt acted as clerk during Dick Baker's last year as council president. And of course, one wonders whether they recall their earlier adventures and Dick's famous map during no doubt earnest discussions over the application of standing orders and the coming federation. Now Blackmore too was a significant man about town with many important connections. He was a member of the Adelaide Hunt Club including as its master and secretary, and they hunted very often from Morialta, the Baker family home. He was a member of the Church of England Synod, a member of its Aboriginal mission at Penindi, a governor of St Peter's College, and coach and official of the Adelaide Rowing Club. He married the daughter of Archdeacon G.H. Farr, who was headmaster of St Peter's. He also lectured in history at the um, University of um, Adelaide. In 1900, he wrote a book about the establishment of the South Australian Bushmen's Corps, formed to fight in South Africa, the organising committee of which he'd been a member. Now the chair, second from the left, is Jenkin Coles, one of the six footers from the Ministry of Giants, and Blackmore is there on the right. And although his um, stentorian voice um, rung out the proclamation of the Australian Commonwealth on the 1st of January 1901, um, you can see that he wasn't a tall man. His career as a parliamentary officer was enhanced by his work on a series of parliamentary texts crowned by his production of a manual of practice for the House of Assembly and one for the Legislative Council. 
He was the only person in Australia doing this at the time. And his string of titles, which included a series of, of several books of rulings of, of the speakers of the House of Commons in London, set him apart from the usual run of parliamentary officers from the other colonies. I'm pretty sure they probably inspired South Australian-born Jim Odgers when he was preparing his work half a century later. It seems, however, that Blackmore's ambitions to become the foremost parliamentary officer of the new nation were not widely shared. In Melbourne, where the clerk of the parliament's G.H. Jenkins saw Blackmore's ambitions as beyond the scope of his duties as the clerk of a parliament of a minor colony, Blackmore's claims to be the first of his cohort went beyond what was appropriate. For Jenkins, Blackmore was head of a service same as importance is a parish council, no more important than the Board of Works. He was someone who wrote a few useless compilations of imperial speaker's decisions for the sake of notoriety. Those paltry collections of pre precedents are only a low advertising judge. Not popular in Melbourne. <laughs> Yet it was his clerkship of the 1897-98 convention that had really brought him to the national audience. Now, I haven't found any correspondence between Blackmore and, and Baker about Blackmore's quest to be clerk of the Senate. He may have understood the power lay elsewhere and uh, lobbied others. For example, A.J. Peacock of Victoria, who showed his letters to the Victorian Clark Jenkins was quite outraged that Blackmore appeared to be asking him for a testimonial. Blackmore wrote further letters to Peacock to withdraw any such suggestions he may have made. But once it appeared that Barton would be the new Prime Minister, Blackmore was on the front foot. Uh, following his, his participation in the proclamation of the Commonwealth in January, he was working out of Sydney, well before he was appointed as Clerk of the Senate on the 1st of April, 1901. Barton used him to write the first standing orders for both houses, while Jenkins, first acting Clerk of the House, arranged the opening ceremonies. Meanwhile, Baker was gentlemanly enough to hold on to Blackmore's letter of resignation from the council, until his appointment as the first clerk of the Senate came through. Well, Baker easily won the first debate, the, 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 the ballot for first president of the Senate by 21 to 36. Um, and his reputation as a chair was widely acclaimed. On the other hand, Blackmore's clerkly efforts were not overwhelmingly appreciated. The Senate rejected a motion to adopt his draft standing orders and relied on those of the South Australian House of Assembly that had been used at the constitutional conventions. The Senate Standing Orders Committee then worked up its own set. The draft standing orders sat on the table for a couple of years till they were debated in June and August 1903. But between those two periods of debate, another Standing Orders Committee report was tabled that revived the old idea of a standing order that referred to the House of Commons in Westminster as the source of all other parliamentary rules. It was diametrically opposed to Baker's views, but he was outvoted in the committee, though not in the Senate. There's more digging to do, but it seems to me that this report was influenced by a Senate clerk about to lose one of his last important battles with his president. Now, all of Blackmore's old South Australian publications, his volumes of rulings, his manuals for the operation of both houses, had been predicated on aping the House of Commons. On the other hand, Baker had a completely different view of the role of the Senate in the future operation of the Australian Parliament. It was not a copy of the House of Commons that Baker was pursuing. It was a new federal structure that brought together the representatives of the state, states in a new kind of parliament whose sole difference from the powers of the House of Representatives was to be specified only in section 53 of the constitution. He didn't want just another variation of colonial upper house, but a new institution. 
So there are many examples of standing orders where he attempted to excise layers of meaning from th that had accrued over centuries in Great Britain. Although undoubtedly a conservative, Baker had no love for meaningless ritual. And an example of his minimalism is the kind of statement a newly elected president might make to a governor general when presented to that officer after his election. The usual kind of thing that was claimed from a head of state, be it a governor of the colonial parliaments or the Queen in Great Britain, was a summation of what the House of Commons had been claiming since the mid-16th century. It was a claim to their undoubted rights and privileges and praying that the most favourable constructions may be put upon all their proceedings. In other words, the get out of jail free card. This is what Blackmore's draft had had. And uh, if senators took any notice of the minutes for the first day of the new parliament in 1901, this is apparently what had happened. Whether it did or not is a moot point. When the relevant standing order was debated in 1903, the new terms had the president in the name and on behalf of the Senate claiming the right of free and direct access and communication with His Excellency. Well, Senator Best, who wasn't on the Standing Orders Committee, wanted to amend it to restore the old rights and privileges approach. But the president was blunt in his assessment. And here I quote him. The old words were departed from because they are a survival of the procedure which has come down to us from the time of the Tudors and Stuarts, when the Speaker of the House of Commons claimed from the Crown certain rights and privileges. And just as an aside, Baker did know about Tudor speakers. He was descended from Henry VIII's last speaker, Sir John Baker of Sissinghurst. Yes, that Sissinghurst, where, for those in interested, you can still see a Baker the, the Baker coat of arms carved into the gatehouse. Oh, no, John Baker, carved into the gatehouse. From a heraldic point of view, it shares various devices, including three swans with Dick Baker's own crest, but that's a bigger side. To go back to what Baker was saying, the use of the words has been continued by all parliaments down to the present time, although now they involve the ridiculous absurdity of the president or the speaker claiming from the crown rights which the crown cannot grant. And the crown solemnly granting those rights. Is it not time we stop that? What right has the crown to abrogate the common law? Under section 49 of the constitution, we have all the powers, immunities and privileges of the British House of Commons, and it's under that section of our constitution that we are exempt from the law of libel and from arrest while attending parliament. It seems to me we should adapt our procedure to existing circumstances, and we should not ask His Excellency to grant us that which he cannot grant and leave him to pretend to do that which we know he cannot do. Well, why have anything, asked Senator Best. So the current form was arrived at, which makes no mention at all of what the president says to the governor general on presentation. It's already in the constitution. So what was the relationship between Blackmore and Baker? My view is that it probably worked best for Blackmore when he was clerk of the legislative council happily conferring with his friends in Westminster about precedence while Baker learned the ropes as presiding officer. But Baker went much further and came to a much deeper understanding of the role of the Senate than Blackmore ever did. It also seems to me that when parliamentary officers moved to Melbourne to take up their posts, none of Blackmore's previous man about town activities in Adelaide translated. Maybe it was the death of his wife in 1901. Maybe his health was beginning to decline. In any case, his years in the Senate, particularly after he lost so comprehensively on the standing orders, were without any of the major publications that had made his name hitherto. Though having led the cohort of Australian clerks in the years leading up to Federation, Blackmore's post-Federation career was, to my mind, much diminished.
For Dick Baker, however, his last years in the Senate were potentially his best. In 1904, he wrote a memorandum on how the Senate might establish its procedural independence, entitled Remarks and Suggestions on the Standing Orders. The paper was a response to the absence of what I call that umbilical standing order tying the practices of the Senate to those of the House of Commons. Baker held that in cases not specifically provided for, we should gradually build up rules, forms and practices of our own, suited to our own conditions. He suggested that the President should make rulings on the best procedure to adopt, and as later agreed by the Senate, rulings should stand unless the Senate altered them. Each session, the President should report on previous rulings and identify any where the result was inconvenient, allowing the Senate to decide the matter. The President's first such report was tabled in 1905, and all Presidents since then have added to the corpus of knowledge about interpreting the Senate's rules against constitutional principle. It's a practice that's absolutely fundamental to the Senate's independence. Well, when Dick Baker died in 1911, he was thoroughly lauded as a great constitutionalist. He did more than most to design an institution to represent the people of the states and to ensure that its early operation went as far as it possibly could in it achieving its goal of equality among the states, regardless of their population size. But I suppose there are many reasons why he's been forgotten. He was a conservative member of parliament, not at all fashionable amongst the rediscovered radicals of the centenary of federation era. He didn't pursue a ministerial career and was not therefore seen as a leading light by those same historians. He championed the Senate as a state's house to represent the interests of the smaller states, never a popular cause. As he foresaw, his vision of federation was soon overtaken by the dominance of responsible government in the political mix, a dominance that was exacerbated by global events starting in 1914. As a parliamentarian, rather more than a politician, Baker's abiding interest in the structure of governance was nonetheless focused on advancing the interests of businessmen such as himself, interests which for him were consonant with the national interest, but which for many others became emblematic of individualistic self-interest over national concerns. In short, he was a capitalist. Other political movements prospered to promote the kind of broader community focus he would have abhorred. Finally, without direct heirs, not to mention suburbs named after him, it's easy for his legacy to be diminished. So the challenge is now to preserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rosemary. We do have um, some time for questions, as, as we always do. I, I will um, invite uh, people to the microphones on either side of the, uh, of the hall if you do wish to ask a question. And um, if I don't get a question from at least one former usher of the Black Rod, I see you up there, Mr. Hallett. I'll be most, uh, most disappointed. Yeah, Ms. Griffiths up there as well. It's very, it's a good cause. Former Senator Weber is up there with yes. Senator Moore. Just Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here, here, here comes uh, Mr. Hallett. Oh. Rosemary, thank you very much for a, f a fascinating lecture. Do we? You didn't really say much about what his contemporaries, particularly other senators, um, said about him. Um, is that a sort of uh, a completely separate area of in inquiry, or? Well, y yes, I suppose it is. I, I didn't um, look. Oh, I didn't use material in his, um, you know, departure debate or his obituary. Um, I did mention, of course, George Pearce, who was a member of the first Senate and um, who wrote a book about um, his recollections of the era. But um, I, I think although Baker did have enemies and one of them was another South Australian senator, uh, Josiah Simon, um, who seemed to fall out with everybody. 
he was another lawyer and um, oh, he, he, was, he was a very pernickety person. And um, it came to a point where Simon, I think, was actually Baker's mother's lawyer, um, but had got to the point where he just wouldn't communicate with, with Baker at all. So, you know, there, there were, there must have been things about Baker that did get up people's nose. But um, for the most part, he seemed to be highly regarded by his, his peers and, um, you know, very highly regarded as a chair. And that's what they were interested in, getting a fair go from the chair. And um, he was, um, you know, highly, highly lauded. I don't know that people are rushing to oh, ask. Just yes, hand up here, please. Um, that is too, Mr. Hodges. Thank you, Rosemary, very much. I'd like to ask if I've formed the wrong impression that he wasn't of a democratic um, sentiment. Um, being relatively undemocratic um, and and perhaps even un unrepublican, um, how, how did this translate into his attitude towards the party system, which might have been forming at that time? He had a very strong sense of the party system. Um, to go to the point about democracy, I, I don't think he was undemocratic, but I think he had pretty much a born to rule attitude to life and, and you know, people should keep their places. He, he, he hated socialism, he hated the idea of, of socialism. But um, certainly on matters of principle, I mean, in response to the first Labor members being elected to the South Australian Parliament, he had formed a new political party called the, the Democratic League. And when he became president in 1893 in South Australia, he made you know, a big point of stepping back from activities of, of the party so that he could be seen to be impartial in the chair. So is that balance between that man of principle in the chair, but also a you know, pretty down and dirty politician when he needed to be. And one final question, thank you. Um, in a sense, that, doesn't that explain why he's been erased from public recollection. Quite. Is, uh, as president, he's neutral in his preoccupations. Uh, did he ever go and make public speeches after assuming the role that commented on the issues of the day, on protection, free trade, whatever it is with, that was running? Are they in the press when he was running for re-election or are they totally lost? Uh, well, he... he um I think he only served one term as a senator, but certainly the campaign material from earlier elections to the council drew on all, all his experience in you know, many forms. He continued to write things for the press, but I suppose his later contributions were more about you know, federation and, and the idea of federation. He, um, he's interesting in that um, he was a free trader and the first government wasn't a free trade government. So he's one of the very few presidents we have where he wasn't from the governing party and he seemed to have been elected on his merits as a chair rather than uh, anything else. He had competition from Victorians for, for the chair, but um, he didn't, uh, he, he, he was able to, to overcome them. But I, I think you're probably quite right. He sort of stepped back from the politics he, tr he tried to um, take on more stately roles. Um, so, for example, he was very proud to go and, and represent Australia at the Indian Durbar in 1904, where uh, Edward VII was proclaimed emperor of, uh, of, of everywhere. And uh, <laughs> the Audrey Tennyson has a lovely bit about how many blouses young Addie took because she went with him rather than his wife. But uh, yeah, he was sort of a, a, a partisan, non-partisan, if you get what I mean. He's uh, had it both ways. Well, thank you everyone for coming along to uh, the fourth annual Harry Evans Lecture. Um, I'd 
like to ask you to join me in thanking our presenter today, Dr Rosemary. And we'll see you, uh, see you here again for our, our final lecture of the year soon. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.